thank you, Center for Fiction, for, for having us. Uh, Lionel, congratulations. Is this your is this your 14th novel? Do I have yeah. that right? 14th novel, 15th book of fiction. Wow. And is this your official pub week? Are we in it? Did it just happen? You don't know. I think it was actually last week. Okay. So Once you have 14 novels, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> so this novel, you do something here that readers who are familiar with the post-birthday world will recognize you. You employ a technique where you kind of map out uh, scenarios of things that might happen to a character if they made one choice or the other choice. The movie Sliding Doors also employs this technique. So, so for instance, in the post-birthday world, a woman was deciding if she should choose one man or another man. And you showed what her life would be like if she went each way. Um, tell us what the choice at the center of this book is and who's making it and why. Oh, it's about a couple, both of whom work for Britain's National Health Service. And uh, when the book starts, they're in their early 50s. And uh, the wife's father has uh, finally died. I say finally because uh, he had descended into advanced dementia and um, had in some ways died a long time before in a meaningful sense. So that uh, when he finally uh, has a funeral, his daughter can't even bring herself to cry. Um, and, you know, the, it's, that's like the one thing that's worse for, than bereavement. It's not experiencing bereavement. Hmm. And so on, on that evening, uh, she, she and her husband get talking and her husband brings out a plan that he's obviously been thinking about for quite some time. Um, after all, in uh, when you're in the medical profession, you see an awful lot of decayed specimens um, living well beyond what might have been their sell by date in another era. And so he suggests that since by his observation, beyond about the age of 80, it's all downhill. Maybe they should be proactive about it and commit to ending their lives together once they have both crossed that threshold on Kay's 80th birthday. So if you're, if you're a, an active reader, <laughs> you immediately wonder, uh-huh, well, that's all very easy for you to say now but what's it gonna be like uh, 30 years from now when that, that promise comes due? And that's the question that the book poses. And it, uh, it plays out in a series of 12 different parallel universes. Uh, and some of them are very realistic and uh, some of the latter chapters are more outlandish going into more the range of speculative fiction you know it's obviously got a, a, a terrifically downer premise but <laughs> as a consequence i tried to uh articulate the ideas in a very playful way the structure is playful i was uh, especially enjoying getting back to that parallel universe uh, technique that i use for post-birthday and, and to a purpose, you know, I, I don't ever like to use um, formal invention for its own sake uh, because I am trying to probe, you know, what, what is the right thing to do when, if you get to the age of 80 and you've made this promise to each other, uh, yet maybe, that, you know, when they do arrive at that date, they're not in that bad a shape. They, they haven't become demented as they feared. Uh, they have their aches and pains, but they don't have some kind of terminal diagnosis or agonizing condition. And this makes it a lot more difficult to follow through on what would have to end up feeling a, a, a date that is, is a bit arbitrary, a bit arithmetic. Right. But that, the problem, go good. Ahead. Well, no, the problem there, of course, is that even if you are in pretty good shape when you're 80, it could be the next day that suddenly you're not, 
and you're not in a position to make this decision. Uh, because this is a kind that these medications must be self administered, as is always the case, I think, all, almost always, unless you've got a physician assisted suicide kind of scenario. Oh, of course, I put it in the uh, put the store in the UK purposefully because, as the law is currently uh, put together in Britain, uh, assisted suicide is wildly illegal. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they would have to administer it themselves. Uh, they couldn't bring in a third party. And so this couple has three children. Uh, they are, there is one scenario, we don't want to give away too much, but maybe we can talk about a couple of different of the, uh, a couple of different of these universes. So in one of them, uh, they are in the process of offing themselves and the children come rushing in and kind of abort the mission. Uh, and then there are others in which one of them goes through with it and the other doesn't. We imagine what it would be like if Kay, for instance, lived on her own. Uh, there's a couple of different care homes as they're called in the UK. We would call them nursing homes, I guess, some better than others. Um, how did you, did you sort of like, did you, did you kind of, did one scenario lead to the other or did you kind of just have this whole kind of gestalt in your head and then had to figure out an order for them? Um, I planned it all out in advance and honestly, I laid this book out in a couple of hours. Ugh, <laughs> don't say that everyone's gonna hate you. All, all writers are gonna hate seethe and jealousy, okay. Yeah, well, if, if, if everyone doesn't hate you uh, as a writer, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> That's another conversation. Yeah. Um, so like, for, tell us for instance, what happens in one of these, uh, one of these nursing homes, let's say. Well, there are two scenarios that end up in care homes. Uh, and in, in one, their children have, have them committed. They've been sectioned because they've been caught, you know, with, these suicidal plans. And that means that you are a danger to yourself and the state can intervene and uh, take control of you. And so they, they end up put, being put in, in, a, in an establishment which is not of their choosing. And it is deliberately over the top. I mean, it's the worst possible place I could, could think of. Um, uh, at the very beginning, they, they meet this woman who runs it called Mimi Mushaw. She goes by Dr. Mimi. And of course, she's not really a doctor. And she's a deliberate, you know, variation on the nurse ratchet character. So, you know, if Ken Casey is listening, um, yeah, I borrowed your idea. It's, it's definitely a cuckoo's nest kind of construct. Um, and you know the food is grotesque. Of uh, the, it, it, it's a it's very controlling. It, it's basically a fascistic establishment and a sadistic establishment. So, uh, I I basically tried to put together the the one place where, that I would be most unhappy. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because there's another care home that you set up as being quite posh having all the accoutrements. And quite frankly, it still seems miserable to me. It's like, you know, even, even the most luxurious cruise is still a cruise. Yeah. And uh, I, for one, would want to escape. So uh, tell us about that one. Um, that chapter is called the precautionary principle. And rather than go through with their pack, what they decide to do is prepare for the future in a way that uh, other people never seem to. And so they save their money. They don't go on a lot of uh, cruises, if you will. <laughs> um, and so they're all, they're, they are completely prepared for their old age. And in fact, they enter this high-end uh, place, which is right on the coast. It's beautiful uh, in their in their early 70s, which is kind of pushing the program. That was the concept. And that means that, you know, that they, they have snooker tables and swimming pool and you can walk on the beach and there's a rowing machine. It, it, they, there's, you know, high-end restaurant 
uh, food. Uh, actually, there's a recurrent motif of, of a, a wild mushroom fajita. <laughs> um, the weird thing is that it still sucks. Yeah. yeah. And that's because the problem with being in a, a, an institution like that isn't just that you know it, it exerts control over your life or the or the food is bad it's it's because it is what it is you have been sidelined and what they end up wondering is whether or not they've been they prepared too well the kind of the, the moral of that particular chapter is you know you can you can be too prudent and lose out on too much of your life just by preparing for the worst part of it. Yeah. Can you read um, just a little bit from the book, Lionel, so we can have a taste? Oh, sure. Um, I'm just gonna read you a page. It's from the first chapter. It doesn't take any preparation. Um, it's just a dialogue between my two main characters. I can find it. Where'd it go? That's okay. This is, um, you can talk this, to them. Okay. I'll talk. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think people, I just want, I want you to read, but I also want to make sure people know this is a very, very funny book as are all of your books, no matter how dark they get, there's, um, there's an exaggerated drama that ends up being very, very, um, it's just cartoonish is too reductive a word, but very droll. Are you not finding it? You, we can skip it. Yeah. Okay. Hold it. I found it. I found okay. it. Okay. Apologies to I don't know, know. An unprofessionalism that I deeply disapprove of. Um, <laughs> ironically, audience, um, I don't actually have a copy of my own book in Brooklyn. You don't know so, that this is your pub date and you don't have a copy of the book. Yeah. That's how cool you are. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Okay. Everyone thinks they're the exception, Kay said morosely, propping her feet on the opposite chair. Everyone looks at what happens to old people and vows that it will never happen to them. They won't put up with it. They have their standards. They value quality of life. Somehow they'll do something so their aging will proceed with dignity. If they ever do die, not that most people believe in their heart of hearts that they ever will, they'll be wise, warm, funny, and sound of mind until the very end with doting friends and family gathered round. Everyone thinks that they have too much self-respect to allow a stranger to wash their private parts or to incarcerate themselves in a care home that's either sterile and impersonal or filthy and impersonal. Then it turns out that, lo and behold, they're exactly like everyone else. And they fall apart like everyone else and finish out the miserable end of their lives like everyone else, either with some Bulgarian in the spare bedroom who despises them and sneaks their whiskey, or in a cynical institution that cuts corners by serving meat paste sandwiches on stale white bread for every lunch. That's what I'm rounding on, Cyril said. I've seen enough geriatric patients come and go to surmise pretty conclusively that very few people sustain that quality of life we currently take for granted beyond about the age of 80. The chronic conditions come thick and furious. Even if the mind doesn't go, the body implodes. And daily life almost exclusively concerns pain. Every advancing year entails a whole new set of things that you used to do and now you can't. Worlds shrink, nothing in the newspaper matters. Until all you care about is lessening the pain or at least not letting it get any worse and possibly food in the unlikely event that you still have an appetite. It's a good round number. So I fancy that 80 is the limit. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm not going to ask how old you are, but maybe I can ask, when did you start thinking about this kind of stuff? Like oh, I'm, last year, five years, last five years, 10 years, more than that? I thought about getting old from a very early age. <laughs> Um, I my first novel is about a woman who's 59 years old and I do look back at this with a sense of grim hilarity. Because, How old were you when you wrote it? Um 20 27 so you were appropriating the experience of a 59 year old. It was. I've been into appropriation for a long time, which is to say I wanted to be a fiction writer. But what I, I, I was gonna say, I, I made her 59 because I thought that was old. <laughs> and, and now I look back on that and no, it ain't. <laughs> um, but it was a way of anticipating that, that I was going to get older. And I, I, I've had an eye on it for a long time. I mean, there are different ways of approaching your distant future. Um, one of them is to ignore it or to deny it. And there's a lot to be said for that, for the shank of your life. Uh, but I've been hyper, hyper aware of it. And now, of course, I don't have much choice because I'm, I'm past my, my old uh, main character, Gray Kaiser's age by, well, it's, you know, you can look it up on Wikipedia, five years. So... You know, I'm I'm much older than my main characters in uh, Should We Stay uh, when they make that promise to themselves. Uh, and the age of 80 isn't really that long from now for me. And I can't tell you how shocking I find that. So do you have thoughts about what you would do in their position? If, if you decided to entertain this dilemma? I, I think that I wouldn't be prone to that kind of commitment to a particular number. Uh, I would be more inclined to keep an eye on what kind of life I'm living and how I feel physically and whether I'm still taking pleasure in life. Uh, the tricky part is, as I think you alluded to earlier in the event, is that it's easy to let, to let this issue slide until you deteriorate so much that you're really in no shape to be proactive about it. Uh, I, a friend of mine in London, her, um, her father also was anticipating uh, their, his future and his wife's future and installed the appropriate medication in their refrigerator should they ever deteriorate to the point where it would be better that um, they left the building. And, uh, but ironically, the, the father died of natural causes. He wasn't a young man, but he certainly hadn't started to go downhill at all. Mm -hmm. And his wife lived on and she has become extravagantly demented and is now in no condition to consent to taking medication, which she would have no idea what it did. I mean, it, 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 she lost her chance. Right. It, uh, it's all about the timing. You yeah. have to get the timing exactly right. And there's also, I think um, there's data in states in the US anyway, where death with dignity laws are in place, the vast majority of people who obtain life ending medications don't end up using it. It's really, it's, it kind of functions as, as an insurance policy or a sort of, you know, a, a safety, it's like a, it's like a, it's like an exit ramp that you yeah. don't, that most people don't end up using. That's right. It's a sort of morbid rabbit's foot. Yes, that's another, another and, and way. Right. And in fact, one of the ironies about the big debate around assisted dying law is, you know, if you pass these laws, not very many people take advantage of them. Right. And the big fear is that, you know, all these droves of elderly people will throw themselves, you know, metaphorically off the cliff 
because they're terrified of being burdens to their families and to society, society at large. And the truth is very few people feel guilty for a living. Uh, and very few people uh, have the courage of their convictions to override what is a biologically ferocious desire to keep living and in any condition possible. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a passage uh, in one of the chapters in Should We Stay that tries to express that saying the, the body wants to keep living. The body is con in, in control and the body will put up with anything. The body doesn't actually feel pain. You feel pain. Mm -hmm. The body can put up with infinite amounts of pain. It will still not pitch itself off a bridge. The body doesn't get bored. The body doesn't need intellectual stimulation. The body doesn't need to continue to go to the opera or to the theater. The body can just lie there for years and rot and it will still keep going to the very last, you know, till the very last crucial organ fails. It, it's kind of astonishing. And you are trapped by your body. Yeah. It, it, ha it owns you. It's a, it's a little prison. Well, we're, we're prisoners of nature in so many ways, yes. not just with this issue. So one of the things I really love about this book is it talks about this particular dilemma, this issue on a very micro level with these particular people and their psychological states and their emotions. But really the backdrop is a changing world, a world that many people would see as deteriorating. Um, there are uh, parallel universes that you lay out that are dystopic, uh, catastrophic in some cases. And, you know, it made me think a lot about something that comes into my mind now and then that I try to kind of tamp back, which is this question of, is there some solace to be taken as you age in the notion that the world is becoming terrible and therefore not worth living in anyway. And is that sort of a mind game that we play with ourselves so we're not as afraid of death or is there increasingly some truth to it? Well, there is some truth to it. I mean, um, death is, is an escape and it's an escape from all the petty concerns of the human world. And I think, I mean, I'm not there yet myself but I can certainly envisage, envisage a, a, a mindset that has simply had enough um, and is ready to leave all this crap to others. It's like, no, I don't wanna worry about global warming. You know, that's your problem. It's not gonna be my problem. And there's a, a kind of vicious glee <laughs> to leaving the world to others, especially if you perceive uh, the, many of the problems that are accelerating and I suspect also intersecting and, and peaking at roughly the same time. I may be totally wrong. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's entirely possible that I'm, I'm starting to adopt the, that, that mindset of good riddance. Um, which is a way of kind of soothing yourself into uh, accepting your, your own mortality. Nevertheless, uh, most of the problems that I follow closely, and I would even say eagerly, since I am a catastrophist by profession, uh, seem to get maximally bad at about the middle of this century. I'm absolutely petrified of about 2050. And strictly speaking, if I live as long as my paternal grandfather did, then I will, I will survive to see one of the most calamitous periods in human history. And I'm very ambivalent about that. Uh, <laughs> as one would be. As one would be. You know, do I really want to live in a world where, you know, there's, there's, I can't take a shower and because there's no water and- well, what, So what do you mean? I mean, you, cause you've written about this in other novels. You've written about global overpopulation. You've written about 
homegrown terrorism. You've written about just the collapse of infrastructure in any number of ways. So when you say you're afraid of what 2050 would look like, what does some of that look like? Well, this is uh, you know a little touchy, a little controversial, but that wouldn't be the first wow. time. Um, we, can't, we can't see anybody's glowering faces in the audience. Yeah. So might as well, uh, well, I'm an amateur demographer. I have been since I was 16 years old. Or there's something about the growth of human populations that fascinates me. If you know anything about the graph, it's just so staggering. It is the biggest thing that has happened while we've been alive is that 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 total going up and up and up. Uh, well, it's true that throughout the Western world, we have curtailed that growth. And if anything, we are headed negative. Uh, a lot of Europe is, is going to start shrinking. But that's not true of Africa and the Middle East. And in fact, both those areas of the world have not reduced their population growth as much as the UN had expected to the point where it is now predicted that the continent of Africa alone will be 4.1 billion people by the end of the century. Well, I've been to Africa and I can tell you right now that continent can't, cannot support environmentally of more than half the population of the world today. And it's just, if, there's not enough water. It, it has, it's no ill reflection on the people who live there. Well, but these are climate issues as well. They right? are climate issues. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the migration we're gonna be looking at is going to be blamed on climate change, but it would have happened anyway, even if the climate had stayed stay the same because the climate in Africa sucks. And it already did suck. Um, and I figure where are these people gonna go if they cannot survive on that continent and you look at the map, it's obviously it's obvious where they're gonna go. They're gonna to go to Europe. It's it's right next door. So it's what do you say? We don't need to get off, totally off track, but what do you say to the person who says, well, the population in the West is declining, so therefore we'll be able to absorb these these migrating groups. Is that not not declining enough? In modest numbers, you know, I'm very pro-immigration. My reservation is about mass immigration, which is much faster than you can possibly absorb people into your society in a graceful way. Uh, and so I portrayed uh, Britain uh, around the middle of the century, completely overwhelmed by migrants, impoverished by migrants. And all, at the same time, I added in a native, a native movement of a bunch of anarchists uh, who are so dismayed by the uh, grimness of, of their future that they just want to burn everything down. I mean, it's, it's the young people of the day have had enough and hate their elders in, uh, and are, ex you know, so they actually have burned down parliament and sacked the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum and uh, shredded the uh, the portraits in the National Portrait Gallery. I mean, it's it's gleefully apocalyptic. It's me. It's having a good time. Um, <laughs> but and and asking the question, you know, if if this is what it's going to be like, if you are Kate and Cyril back in 2020, which is when Kate's 80th arrives, do you go through it? Do you go through with it or not? Would you? want to live to see that if it was going to happen any, anyway, or would you rather not know right. and cut out before everything falls apart and you can kid yourself at least that, that everything's fine? And I, I don't find that question easy to answer. And I even wonder if, although I, I do have a lot of narrative curiosity on a larger historical level, I wonder if I'd rather leave in a state of total delusion. Yeah. Just so folks know, I'm going to start reading your questions about uh, 8.15, a quarter after the hour. So if your you're, questions are piling up, I'm not going to ignore you. It really is like a red pill versus the blue pill kind mm -hmm. of premise, is it not? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, the, the, I, the idea of the red pill has been sort of bandied, bandied about to the point of meaninglessness, but this was the idea from the matrix that if you took the, if you took the blue pill, nothing would change, life as you know it would continue. If you took the red pill, everything that you thought about the world, you would see, you would see the world as it really was, I guess that's yeah. the way. That's, I'm probably butchering that to some degree, but right. Are, are you a gambler, Lionel? Oh, I'm really not. I, 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 I'm mortified by the idea of, of losing 10p in a one-armed bandit. Because it, it occurred to me just now so many, like this whole idea of what would happen if I did this or that, it is, it's a, it's a gambling, you're at the gambling table. You're deciding whether or not you should walk away from the table. That's what is happening in this book. So I was just curious if you had a gambler's instincts. If you no, know I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hopelessly frugal and, <laughs> and in relation to money, risk averse. Um, we should say that in one of these scenarios, the characters live to be well over a hundred years old. Um, there's, they have a technology is such that everybody lives fantastically and forever. And uh, there's no, there's really no hardship. Everything has been solved. Um, and yet uh, it still gets old. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's a, there's one chapter, one of the latter ones, which is, you know, the more fantastic ones. Cause I think structurally there was an obligation to get ever more outlandish as the book progresses. Uh, and so that the, the earlier chapters that they're much more rooted in reality. And you know, in any story has to accelerate. So I accelerate. Uh, and in, in one chapter, um, Kay participates in a drug trial and she doesn't, she clearly doesn't know exactly what it's for, what she's testing, but little by little, her hair gets fuller and she, she thinks it's a trick of the light, but you know, there seem to be less wrinkles in her face and, and she has more energy. <laughs> um, until finally her husband says, you know, you could pass for 35. And he doesn't say it nicely. He says, I don't say that to flatter you. I say that as a fact, what is going on? And she confesses that she's participated in this trial. And it turns out that this is a, this is a very successful drug. It's, it's called retrogeratox. And it both reverses, re reverses the aging process to, to about the age of 25 when you're a, a mature young adult. And then you just stay there. And uh, subsequent progeny uh, also inherit this, uh, you know, secret to eternal life. And therefore the beginning of the chapter is, is really upbeat. It's fun. Believe me, if I had my way, we would all age in reverse. I think there would be a certain justice to that. And you just get more and more beautiful and lively and- uh, But then do you have to go all the way back to being a baby? I don't know. I think there's like a, there's a, there's a sweet spot there. Is, is there not? Yeah, I know, but I think it might be a nice way to go out. <laughs> I don't know. That's true. Just a little point. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk for a minute about the National Health Service. It's almost like a character in the book. Both of the characters have worked for the NHS their whole careers. Cyril's a physician, Kay is a nurse. How important is it to the story that they have this relationship with the NHS? It is important because, uh, well, I mean, first of all, the NHS gets a lot of stick in the United States, but in the UK, it's worshiped. Uh, it actually doesn't deserve a either attitude. I, I, I don't. I don't think that you should wor worship any healthcare system. As <laughs> it all says. Um, but because they have a national health system, it's it, it makes people more involved in the larger social issues because. Every, you know, it's a little bit like everyone having one big insurance company. So it, 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 you have an investment in other people's 
decisions about their health, and you have an investment in the demography of the country, you know, so that if there are many, many more old people, as increasingly they are, your taxes are paying for them if you're if you're younger. Um, and uh, if you're older, then you're aware of the fact that younger people are making sacrifices on your behalf if you're no longer working. So it's that's true also in the United States, uh, but it, it's much more it's much more palpable when there's a single entity that is responsible for the nation's health. And we should say, just for people who don't know, you are an American, but you've lived in the UK for decades now. Yeah. Um, so, and you do live here some of the time, but you're you're sort of uniquely positioned to to see both sides of this. And um, I think I think I feel like Americans sort of do worship the NHS. Uh, I don't know if it's often held up as like you know why can't we do this? Why can't we do it this way? Um, but it depends on your point of view, I suppose. Well, the, portion, the, right, but... the right is constantly using the NHS right. as, as a, an example of how it doesn't work and you have to have all these terrible cues for treatment. Um, right. It's That's... true that the, the left in the US is likely to idolize it in the same manner um, at, in, in a way that denies that it, it has a lot of inefficiencies and dysfunctions, which have accelerated fantastically during the pandemic. So somebody has a question, and I think this is a, a good one to raise. It's certainly relevant. It has to do with the fact that you don't have children. I don't have children either. This is something that both you and I have, have written about. You actually have a, an essay in my anthology, uh, which is a, a collection of pieces by writers about their decision not to have children. Um, it's obviously something that came up in We Need to Talk About Kevin, which was your international best-selling Orange Prize winning novel. Um, you know, obviously we don't have as much skin in the game as other people when it comes to thinking about the world, what's gonna happen. Um, so how does that kind of factor into to your thinking? Cyril and Kay do have children you decided to have them be parents. Um, so, so how do you kind of wrestle with, with all these pieces? Oh, I, I freely admit that when you don't have kids, it's a lot easier to embrace that more nihilistic attitude that we talked about. It's like, good riddance, I don't, I, I've, ha I've had enough. Uh, I'm gonna get out while the going's good. Whereas if you have children, you have made an investment in the future and you can't, if you're a competent parent, you cannot, cannot stop caring about what happens after you die. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the other thing is that when you don't have children, getting older is, if anything, a little grimmer because you know, it's just you and little by little you start losing your friends and it, it, the prospect of old age is even lonelier than it might necessarily be. So yeah, I, I find that sobering. Do you think about your own death, how it might be? Um. I don't think about my death as much as I do my old age. I think I'm, if anything, more afraid of old age than I am of death per se. After all, the experience of, of death, in, in other words, not being here, your own death is the one death you're not gonna experience because it's other people who experience it. It's other people who experience who experienced the world without you in it. And it's gonna be a small collection of people for whom that matters, but perhaps for some people that's, it matters a lot. And so I'm not especially concerned with the experience of dying because it does come with, uh, with that, that sense of relief and 
for having seen people on camera die, it looks fairly quiet. And, you know, it's about the end of pain. It's not about pain, it's about the end of pain. So there's even a line in um, Should We Stay? Uh, in one of the scenarios, uh, Kay, the wife, uh, dies and Cyril is still alive. And he says that he had just rescued her from uh, every, every terrible thing that could possibly happen to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Nothing bad can happen to her ever again. So it's a kind of salvation. Uh, old age, on the other hand, isn't a moment, but can last for many years. And uh, like most people, which is what I tried to express in that reading, I, I don't think of myself as an old person. And, you know, we all get very attached to the idea of being young people. And we, when we are young, we think that that, that we are young people, that, that that's in our essence. Yeah. If that's something that is hard to let go of. And, you know, you get, you, you kind of get old behind your own back. And so it's just like, you turn around and what the hell? <laughs> yeah. What happened? Nobody asked me. And I, I think it's, I think it's fundamentally bewildering. Do you have an age that you think is sort of your psychological set point? What yeah, age do you feel you really are? Yeah, about 10. Really? Yeah, about 10. My sense of myself has not seriously changed since I was 10 years old. Really? Yeah. And just, you think you are just a 10 year old? Obviously, I've, I've changed in lots of ways. But uh, what it feels like to be me walking down the street at 10 and at 64, they're kind of the same. That's interesting. So. Okay. Does this have to do, does this have to do with feeling sort of like, because 10 is prepubescent. Is there a sort of androgyny to this? Is it kind of like you're experiencing the world in a kind of pure, like you're, you're not kind of seeing through the lens of like, a you know, a, a, a woman, a, per, a particularly stereotypically gendered person. Oh, okay. So I live in Washington Heights and every night, we have fireworks going off and that's my dog. Okay. Um, I, think I will mute myself and you can uh, speak while he gets it out of his system. Sorry. sorry. Um, I, what you just said is actually very well observed. And I, I had, that had never occurred to me before, but I think you're right that I, my concept of myself and my experience of being me is highly androgynous not especially sexualized. Uh, and, 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 you know, androgynous is not the same as I think I'm a boy. It's yeah, and also that was not a, I mean, I feel, the reason I asked is I have a sort of similar sense of myself. That was not, um, that was not an accusation or. No, yeah, right in the prison. No, I know. Um, but it, it's, yeah, that it, when I'm alone in a room, I never feel especially female. In fact, I did a whole, essay for Prospect Magazine in the UK on exactly this, that uh, one of my points of dismay in relation to our current gender politics is that we seem to be making gender or sex, whatever we're calling it, uh, more and more important and, and more and more central to identity as to who we think we are. And that's just completely antithetical to my experience of being a human being. That I just, I, I am female by accident. I've got used to it. Um, well, you have a male name. You changed yeah. your name. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that was totally an expression of feeling a bit on the fence. And just, you know, I've never been especially girly, though occasionally, uh, I look pretty good in heels. <laughs> um, and I, I had a very strong response to that essay 
especially from other women. Mm -hmm. I think men are a little more reluctant to let go of an idea of themselves as male in their deepest, truest essence. Whereas women find it more of a release to get away from all the crap we put on being female. Yeah, well, I think men have a narrower lane as well. Well, what but you can be comfortable with themselves. That. Yeah, yes. Okay, and we're gonna start, uh, before we go down that road too far, I will start, I will take some, I will read some questions, audience questions. If I read these out of order, it's not because I'm skipping anybody. I'm just gonna try to sort of bundle these. Um, how do you, this is from Julie, how do you process and absorb current events in a way that aids rather than hinders your writing process and in particular, your wonderful wonderful satirical sense? So yeah, I think this is relevant to what we were saying. You know, you're taking these big issues and, and making them imaginative acts. Um, but is that just on a technical level, is that challenging? Um, it's a little dangerous. I, uh, and I don't mean that just in, in the terms of the current uh, very divided politics, but uh, you can alienate your readership by betraying a, a political position that 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 particular reader finds obnoxious, you know, and that will take them out of the story. So that's a little bit dangerous. I, I try, especially in this book, to go at various bits and pieces of modern political life with a sense of humor. And uh, that makes it a lot easier for readers to get past particular lines that they might take issue with around a dinner table. The, mm -hmm. the real problem is that, and this is where we get into the, the, the woked up world, um, there is a subset of the readership that has no interest in finding some of these jokes funny. And you can't make people laugh. So there are, there are readers who will refuse to find something funny, even if it's hilarious. Um, I had one uh, reviewer claim that uh, The Mandibles, uh, my 2016 novel, did not make a single joke for 400 pages. <laughs> you know, that told me nothing about the book and everything about the reviewer who, who sat there through the whole book glowering and refusing to find even a single line faintly amusing. Hmm. Um, and he was a good example. Of exactly, and he's a book critic. Exactly the kind of reader that I'm talking about that, you know, when you write about polarizing issues, you're, you're you risk losing a measure of, of your audience. And I guess because I am very engaged in what's happening now, and there, there are lots of different issues that I try to keep track of and, and have conflicting and conflicted feelings about, um, even in, in, when I'm writing about it in, in nonfiction. But uh, so I make that sacrifice and, and uh, I also make a sacrifice because I write nonfiction. So my journalism means there's no secret about what I think about practically everything. I mean, if you go online, you can find out my real life views about all sorts of things. And so I, you know, I've removed the mystery uh, and, and, and it, it is, it is important for me to not let that side of my life invade my books too much. Um, it, it was crucial in this book to keep the politics light and playful. After all, you know, there is a certain amount of talk about Brexit, but not only is there balance in, in the talk about Brexit, but what you're supposed to find ultimately funnier than either position is the fact that right up on uh, against uh, the border of, of non-existence, you know, these characters still care. 
I know, really. That's, that's... Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know. It's, and um, so you be talking about Trump when we're 300 years old and uh, trying to figure out if we should kill ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I think I in, fiction, in fiction, right. what you've got an opportunity to do is to apply a little bit of perspective, which right. Well, all and good. also the the fact that you said you know you are you're conflicted. I think anybody who's really honest about their thoughts is is conflicted. Like I always say, if you're not conflicted, you're either lying or you're not very smart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the nice things about fiction is that you can you can engage with your with your sort of cognitive dissonance in a way that's trickier in nonfiction. So somebody tying into that, Molly asks, you've written so many novels, how at this point, how has your writing process evolved over time? And do you have any particular skills or habits that have served you that you can share about. So I actually think that that's, you know, when we're talking about journalism versus fiction, it seems to me that a great skill is that you can just have your characters entertain these, these dilemmas rather than taking it all on yourself. Is that, is that fair, a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah and you, they can voice completely contrary viewpoints. And it's right. very useful. And in terms of my writing process, uh, I think I have got more oriented toward the external world rather than the interior. Uh, my earlier work is much more about romance and family relationships and that kind of thing and is less firmly set in a in an historical time and in a political time. And the later books, even if they're about something which is timeless, you know, still and, and highly personal, uh, it's set in a context. Uh, it, so I'm just, I've become more aware of living in a larger world rather than living in my small private life. Well, and the fact that you live in two different places, you live in two different countries. You know, somebody asks, is there a lure for you in staying in the UK for most of the year due to having access to the NHS? I mean, I would be interested in that answer too, but just more broadly, do you feel like an American still? Do you feel like more of an American since you don't live here a lot of the time? How does that all kind of play out in your identity? Well, I have not adapted a, an artificial English accent. So Can you say process. They're a little changed. You say of issues. Yes, yes. I'm, but you know, you live around that stuff for over 30 years and you'll st start saying tomato too. Um, it just starts sounding normal. Right. And the trouble is that we go home and everybody thinks that you're a pretentious ass. Though they just think you're, it came back from your junior year in college. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have never regretted uh, living abroad for most of the year. Uh, it's been, I think it has made me live in a larger world. I continue to come back in the summer to the United States, so I have not sacrificed uh, keeping a hand in, in here. Uh, so I just, it's I, I live in a bigger, I live in a bigger place as a consequence, and you know it was kind of an accident to, to end up in the UK. I never, I, I didn't grow up as a little girl. Oh, when I, when I'm big, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live in England. <laughs> with the queen <laughs> uh, uh, but that's the way most of us live our lives we may have plans but that we end up in some some existence that we didn't plot out and you know I just moved to Belfast in order to write my uh, third novel and and I got sucked in and ended up in London and, and never left but I've, it's been useful. And um, it's useful for Americans in particular, I think, because this is such a big country that, and it's got so much variation within it that it's easy to mistake the United States for the whole world. And so it's, it's healthy 
uh, to get get beyond our borders sometimes and realize that there are all these other people and places out there uh, where you were a foreigner. Yeah. Well, I guess we need to wrap it up, but maybe just my last question, something to think about, you know, this, this idea of imagining what would have happened if you had made a different choice, it's very seductive as a reader. There's something incredibly satisfying about entertaining that thought process. I mean, I find myself doing that a lot, just thinking about my, my life, my big life choices. I think for whatever reason, I seem to be in a moment in my life where I'm looking back on a lot of stuff and almost like fantasizing about how things would be different if only I had done this or that, pursued a different kind of, you know, not taken this job, taken another job. Um, is that something that you torture yourself with or amuse yourself with? Or do you just confine it to your, to your books and leave it at that? Oh, I, I guess I have occasionally thought about what my life would have have been like if uh, my seventh novel, We Need to Talk About Kevin, had not hit it or not even been published and I was obliged to give up writing fiction and choose a different life. Uh, I feel that I was kind of rescued in the nick of time, um, which is why my story is sometimes useful to other writers because I'm the little engine that could story. <laughs> um, but in terms of just uh, the different choices that I've made, I guess I don't torture myself over them. To circle back to a chapter that we started talking about and got a little distracted, the one in which everyone takes retrogeratox. What was interesting about writing the latter part of that chapter, the one that started out so cheerfully, um, was that living forever and therefore being able to choose everything. You know, there's no limit to the number of careers you can explore, the number of marriages you can have. Uh, you can have whole different friendship groups. Uh, the trouble is that this ends up really flat and there's something deadening about having everything because the choices we're talking about, they're important because they're permanent. You can't go back and decide to spend your 23rd year, for example, differently. You chose to spend it a certain way and that's it. And that's what gives the, 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 the choices we made a sense of urgency. And so, I mean, no, I'm not gonna to torture myself over certain decisions I made. I mean, I didn't even decide to move to the UK and yet I ended up there. And I'm at peace with that. That's how it turned out. Uh, but it, what, it, what I have not given up on is playing with these ideas on paper. And that's one of the great things that you can explore in a novel that, that you can't explore in your real life. I mean, it's, it's not presented to you. You can't, you can't go back and do the, your 23rd year again. So I do find it a, a fruitful fictional exercise, even if it, what I'm actually exploring is the irrevocable decisions that we make in real life. Okay, well, I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you so much. This is such fascinating stuff to think about. And it's all in the book. And the book is very, very philosophical and poignant and profound, but also very hilarious. So I hope everybody keeps that in mind and, um, and buys it and reads it. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Ably uh, interlocuted, if that's okay. Well, it's my favorite thing to do. Easier to ask questions and answer them at this stage for me. Sorry about the dog interruption. He's calmed down. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations, Lionel. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you all again soon. <laughs>